Can gaming predict a pandemic? And if yes, would anyone listen? Or who could have predicted the 2020 pandemic? Well, the answer is anyone who plays games. Let's explore the strange relationship between games and pandemics in this episode of the unauthorized, unofficial history of learning games. Let's go back to 2019. During that time frame from January to August, an interesting activity was taking place all across the U.S. Officially, it was a joint exercise or a tabletop exercise, which I would say is government code word for game. The exercise was called the Crimson Contagion. Sounds ominous or like a really cool video game. And the exercise involved lots of levels of government, war gaming, or trying to predict and practice how the agencies would all work together when facing a national pandemic. The goal was to test the capabilities and capacity of the federal government and the 12 states involved in the mock pandemic to see how they would react to the situation, if they were prepared, and what practice they needed in addition to what they were doing. Several articles describe the Crimson Contagion exercise unfolding in a manner where the highest level of government begins to learn about a global spread of a dangerous virus in cities like London and Seoul. It's a virus that's bad enough that some countries begin imposing travel bans. In the tabletop exercise, the crisis initially erupts in Chicago and not New York, but the consequences that unfolded in the exercise have eerily played themselves out in a manner similar to what happened in New York and across the rest of the United States in 2020. In the Crimson Contagion exercise, the team discovers an outbreak of a respiratory virus that begins in China and spreads throughout the world by air travelers. One of the symptoms in the exercise is a high fever, one is cough. Then during the course of the exercise, the United States detects the disease in Chicago and 47 days later, the World Health Organization declares a pandemic. <laughs> Sound familiar? That's what happened in the Crimson Contagion exercise. And then, by that time in the exercise, it was too late, right? Millions of Americans became infected and hundreds of thousands died in this mock training exercise called the Crimson Contagion. In fact, the Crimson Contagion exercise was what was called the most concrete and visible transition exercise that dealt with the possibilities of pandemics that was created. This is what games can do. They provide visible tangible experiences. It has been reported that the Crimson Contagion exercise actually pointed out many of the weaknesses the United States encountered while dealing with the actual pandemic. While many of the people who participated in that particular tabletop exercise transitioned out of the government before the actual pandemic started, and there's all kinds of partisan bickering has arisen over both the transition and the reaction to the virus, and things have all become really political. But let's not dwell on that. Let's talk about a striking point in all of this, a point I think is crystal clear. One thing that I noticed is that the United States government felt that a version of a war game was an effective and useful tool for preparing officials for the unthinkable. To me, this is clear evidence on the efficacy of using games, not just for learning, but for preparing for possible worst-case scenarios, for predicting a possible future. Remember, when we talked about Paul Sherman, who wrote an article called Models, uh, uh, Models of War, 1770 to 1830, and subtitled The Birth of War Games and the Trade-Off Between Realism and Simplicity. In that article, Sherman talks about the potential of war games to become practical, not merely instructional. To me, that meant predictions. War games can make predictions. Well, by 2020, we're well past that threshold. Crimson Contagion made some predictions. Of course, serious organizations like the United States government can't call exercises like the Crimson Contagion a game. 
So they use other terms to conduct these types of games because it turns out these types of games are really good at predicting and training and helping people to react to asymmetrical threats. It's possible to play out threats on a board which provides the big picture and gives immediate and tangible consequences for not taking actions or for actions taking that are not correct. For example, some of the findings from the Crimson Contagion exercise clearly showed, as the New York Times article suggests, just how underfunded, underprepared, and uncoordinated the federal government would be for a life and death battle with a virus for which no treatment existed. In fact, the Crimson Contagion exercise drew the following conclusions as reported in an October 2019 document published by the United States government. The findings included that in the game, during the playing of the game, federal, the federal government lacks sufficient funding to respond to a severe influenza pandemic. Also, the participants in the Crimson Contagion exercise, the government officials who were playing the game, lacked clarity on the roles of different federal agencies and what information was important to pass on from one federal partner to another. Additionally, in the game, Health and Human Services had issues providing accurate and relevant information to hospitals and other public organizations. In the game, confusion arose among several federal agencies in the game, Health and Human Services, FEMA, and the Department of Homeland Security, because these agencies weren't sure about which federal agency should actually take the lead in certain areas of the crisis. In the game, the United States, they, the players found that the United States lacked the production capacity to meet the demands for PPE, personal protective equipment. In the game, states were unable to efficiently request resources because there was a lack of a standardized request process. Nobody knew how to get the materials they needed. In the game, also uncovered confusion about how to apply the Defense Production Act and found that the medical supply chain and production capability could not meet the demand in the Crimson Contagion exercise. All of these came up and bubbled up as the game was played. The game also found that on a global manufacturing scale, the United States couldn't get the PPE and the equipment and the things they needed from overseas suppliers. Again, the game, the tabletop exercise, the simulation, the war game about the pandemic, it all accurately predicted what's happened. Only, for whatever reason, universal steps were not taken to address the issues that were uncovered on a national level. But there is a bright spot. In Chicago, some of the lessons learned from playing the Crimson Contagion exercise were actually implemented and found to be really useful. The Chicago Sun-Times talks about the city's response by interviewing some key players. One of those is Christopher Shields, who is, this is a long title, he's the Chicago Department of Public Health Assistant Commissioner for Emergency Preparedness and Response. Whew! That's a long title. But basically what he said is that the four-day exercise in August, that's when it was conducted, August 2019, helped prepare the city and the state of Illinois for the current pandemic. The game helped with preparation. He says that after the exercise, officials in Chicago worked on several things. Ways to have better communication during actually deadly crises, ways to improve the handling of shipments of medical supplies, ways to set up field hospitals and morgues, unfortunately, ways to feed hundreds of school children, and ways to take steps to help ensure that millions of people stay away from each other and help slow the spread of the disease. So lots of good things happened. Also, the Crimson Contagion exercise allowed the city of Chicago to figure out the best ways to communicate in a crisis whether that's by teleconferencing, or radio, face-to-face. -face. Shields reported that, uh, that information to the Chicago Sun-Times and said the exercise was really important. Another key player in Chicago who took part in the exercise was Dr. Carolyn Lopez. She's the president of the Chicago Board of Health. And she says that the exercises help City Hall look for better ways to obtain pandemic supplies and better ways to keep track of those supplies. 
Dr. Lopez stated that she and other officials took detailed lessons from the contagion exercise about such things as the supply chain. And she gives a great example about how the game actually helps. She said, look at something as basic as ensuring that standard size delivery trucks are able to get through to different hospitals. Something that you might not have thought about. According to Dr. Lopez, the trucks in the con Crimson Contagion exercise were too big to reach some hospitals, so changes were made on bringing in supplies. And Christopher Shields talks about this too. He describes the logistics situation like this. He said, I'm now receiving X product through the supply chain, but it's not in a normal fashion. So how do I receive that into the city, offload the material, break it down, apportion it to whatever I'm trying to achieve, then repackage it, distribute and deploy on a pretty linear timeline. Shields explains that what they did, they just did that during the exercise, and that helped them understand that, hey, I can't have a 53-foot trailer going down Elston and try to get under the bridge, for those of you who know Chicago. So a critical detail about size of trucks is hard to discover unless you're actually in the pandemic or unless you practice for the pandemic via a tabletop exercise. Dr. Lopez underscores that the game didn't cover every possible issue. For instance, not it didn't touch on the current need to coordinate the state's laboratory or testing protocols, but it did uncover a great deal. Dr. Lopez confirms that the Crimson Contagion dress rehearsal helped prepare Chicago for what's become the massive impact of the coronavirus. So it turns out games can be effective for preparedness, but only if the players, management, and others pay attention to the outcomes. Just like the Japanese admiral bullying the umpires in war games leading up to the Battle of Midway, ignoring outcomes of games can lead to catastrophic results. You've got to pay attention. So the point is not to dwell on what happened or you know, any of the political bickering. The point is to ask ourselves, what lessons can we learn from the mistakes that were made? One really critical lesson, and this might sound harsh, but don't conduct a corporate learning game if you're not going to heed the results. It wastes everyone's time. It puts managers and executives and frontline employees through this simulated situation, and then it gets ignored. And that is not a good because ignoring unfavorable or unanticipated outcomes is not fruitful for these kind of exercises. It gives strategic games a bad reputation. You start to get reactions like, why are we playing these stupid games? You know, no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome, nobody ever does anything. What a waste of time. That gives a really bad reputation to learning games like these and should be avoided. So rule number one is don't do the exercise if you're going to ignore the results. The second rule is the, just the opposite of that. Don't think that every result of the exercise is going to happen. Like the old saying goes, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Strategic games hardly ever reflect 100% of what will actually happen in reality. Strategic games like Crimson Contagion are approximations built on models. The outcomes are only as good as the models and what everybody can think of, as we mentioned in previous episodes. So review and carefully consider the results, but don't blindly follow them. They are one source of input. They should not be your only source of input. The third rule is that everyone must take the activity seriously and act in good faith. The ideal application of tabletop exercises designed in a manner similar to war games is that the players involved act and react as they would in the actual situation. You need to stress to all the players that the game is to be taken seriously and that the outcomes will be impacted by how realistically all the players react. In the Crimson Contagion, the outbreak began and escalated tremendously in Chicago. Even to this day, Chicago has not been hit as hard as some other cities in the United States because locally, they took the results seriously. They acted on the results, and that was very helpful. 
The fourth rule is that games won't uncover everything. Don't expect every single aspect of every situation to be addressed by the game. It's just not possible. Remember Admiral Nimitz? He said that every possible World War II contingency was played out in the war game, except they didn't expect the kamikazes. There will always be areas that will be missed. Understanding that reality is a helpful part of planning and is part of playing strategic war game type exercises. Keeping these rules in mind will help you to develop and ultimately implement an effective strategic war game type activity. Those activities will help you both predict the future and teach people how to prepare for it.